Welcome to the Church Safety Guys broadcast with hosts James McCarvey, Paul Buckner, and Mike Scully. Together they make up the Church Safety Guys, their mission to inspire, influence, and impact church safety teams. Join us for the next hour as we talk about all things church safety and security. Don't forget to like our Facebook page, join one of our church safety and security communities online, and share this broadcast with your church. Well, good evening and welcome to the Sunday night broadcast of the Church Safety Guys. Thanks for joining us tonight. I am James and I am joined by my co-hosts, co-hosts one of these days I'll say it right, cohorts, cohorts, crash, whatever. crash and burn, Mike and Paul. How are you guys doing tonight? Good, sir. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Yeah. This is the, the first episode of the new year and uh, we're just, we're glad we're blessed to be back with you guys. Hopefully you had a, a blessed holiday season and uh, we're getting ready to, to go for it, wind up. And we are we have a phenomenal season four lined up. Let me just say, I am pumped <laughs> and I am really excited. Uh, so you definitely, if there was ever a season to sleep through and, and not miss, it's not season it's not four. <laughs> There are several personal heroes of mine that James has queued up for this year. I am pumped. We've had we've we've been blessed with some great folks that wanna wanna come on and and talk with us about not just church safety but just church culture and and some different things that uh, that really impact church safety and church ministry in the community. So I'm very very grateful that uh, that we've had had those connections and been able to make them. So uh, if you are joining us for the first time, uh, again, welcome. If you're listening on uh, podcast or YouTube, uh, feel free to click like and subscribe on the lower right hand corner. And uh, you're welcome to in the in the comments post what church you're with, where you're from. And uh, we will uh, that kind of helps us know where, um, you know, our listeners and demographic are and uh so we'll we'll kind of um, kind of go from there. If you have a question about tonight's broadcast uh, or a question while we're doing it, you're welcome to reach out to us on um, online live. You can just post your question in the the comments section, and we'll do our best to try and get to it. And then later, uh, if you're listening to this on an off uh, off time, not live broadcast. You're welcome to uh, email us and check out our resources at churchsafetyguys.com. And we've got some great resources there. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We just released uh, about a month ago, we've released the, the case for church safety and security. And I can tell you that has skyrocketed. Um, we have actually in the last month have sold uh, probably more copies of that than any other uh, any other resource and, and uh, donated and we've had churches reach out to us and bless us with covering expenses for giving copies away and uh, it's just phenomenal. We we actually had a church reach out to us and, and say that they were going to require their entire safety team uh, to read read it and it was like a prerequisite for serving on their safety team, which I was just blown okay. away. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness, thank you. Um, but because of that, we actually, I actually put together a workbook. Um, so now there's a separate companion uh, group study workbook that goes along with that. And uh, it allows uh, allows for the group setting. We've had a few people ask like what's, what's in it. And basically it takes every chapter and then adds additional scripture and then also um, adds questions that you might uh, you might want to use to facilitate a group discussion in like a small group or life group type setting. So great resource uh, if you're uh, if you're interested in um, taking a look at that or even getting bulk copies again, reach out to us at churchsafetyguys.com and we can we can certainly help you out with that. So. Um, very, again, very blessed, very pumped to be here. Looking forward to it tonight. Uh, tonight, we actually have uh, some special folks with us, and uh, they are from the ministry All Things Possible, uh, Victor Marks, and we're going to be talking about human trafficking, and 
Uh, I'm excited about this because I, I honestly, I feel very passionate that the church needs to do something. And as this, as we're, we're trying to make a difference in our communities, um, church safety and security is, is always important, but this crosses that line and this comes into church churches and impacts church safety and security. So it's something that we can all benefit from, uh, knowing a little bit more information about. So, uh, without further eloquence, I'm going to go ahead and bring Jeff and Samantha in here. Uh, so welcome guys. Thanks for hanging out with us tonight. Hi James, <laughs> Mike and Paul. Hey, thanks, thanks for having us guys. Thank you. We're trying to make it simple. I miss, I miss the little picture of all the, the little caricatures of all oh. you guys. I'm like, dang it. Where'd that go? That was so cool. <laughs> well, Thank you. I'm going to give Mike the credit for that because it was actually his idea. I was like, no, I don't want a caricature. And he's it's like, so yeah, cool. but it's cool. <laughs> well, it started, the funny thing is it started when the three of us literally had not physically met. We had basically gotten involved in this and never had actually met each other. So right. it started as this idea. We needed to merge three of our photos together and put us together as the church safety guys. Well, we were blessed this past year and actually did get a chance to meet each other, um, which is great. There's no but, photographic yeah. evidence of it. There is no <laughs> photographic evidence. I don't know. It but is it pretty great. funny. We're The three of us are, are, I would say, pretty close. I mean, we honestly, we talk to each other probably about once or twice or more a day. A day. And uh, what's amazing to me is I'm in Columbus, Mike's in Texas, and Paul's in Missouri. So we just... Wow. I mean, the three of us just met and we hit it off and on most days we try not to kill each other. So <laughs> it's all good. I'm here now so I can referee if needed. So yeah. don't worry. Sweet. <laughs> we've never, we've never had an awkward online broadcast where that's been necessary, but thank you. I appreciate, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the sentiment. So we'll start, actually, let's, uh, let's start with Jeff. We'll, we'll ask, uh, Jeff, just give us a little bit of your background and uh, all things possible. So guys, I'm a, I'm a career soldier. I joined the Army when I was 17, got out, went to college, and came back in and, and just retired about five years ago. I was in the special operations community that whole time. And as I was moving towards retirement and trying to figure out what I wanted to do next and looking at kind of the, the gifts that God had given me innately and then what uh, other men and women had poured into me, I, I really wanted to continue in this idea of the special forces motto, which is to free the oppressed, the oppresso liber. That's the, that's the special forces motto. And little did I know, as I was working in that community, it, it became more than a motto to me, but something that was just really deep, deep in my heart. Um, and so I started to look at this problem of, of sex trafficking and, and, and the abuse of children and sexual industry, underground sexual economy, all of that. Um, really because God laid it on my heart. So I, I began studying it years ago, meeting people like Samantha and, and other survivors who lived through this um, and tried to understand what, what this problem looked like, what the aspects were. And, you know, I thought perhaps my expertise as a counterterrorism professional or a counterinsurgency professional would have some, some overlap with a counter-trafficking professional, but it's absolutely a one-for-one. One. There are incredible similarities um, and it shouldn't surprise people. When you talk about insurgency and terrorism, it's just simply exploitation. And when you talk about sex trafficking, it's just simply exploitation. So um, within the last, uh, I, I was working with an organization called Guardian Group that's focused wholly on counter sex trafficking and then had been working on and off with Victor, Victor Marx and All Things Possible for years. Um, and then just made the slip over here. We're looking to expand what we do in the United States in a counter trafficking space. All Things Possible um, has three major programs, trauma relief, our high risk ministry, and then training, training and equipping. And our anti-trafficking, counter trafficking efforts kind of blend in with, with all three of those. And we're proud to partner with Ruby's Las Vegas, which Samantha founded. Um, we have an interesting partnership. We're actually gonna meet and for the first time this coming week, Samantha and, and some of the people that she's invited are coming out to our training center here in Colorado to do some shooting and fighting and spiritual um, warfare 
and fellowship. So not necessarily in that order. But, uh, <laughs> an interesting, uh, an in- interesting combination. We've, I think we found this alchemy of how to um, break down egos, find triggers that people still need to address and opening doors for the spirit to, uh, to fill them. That's awesome. So you're, when you, when you list off those things to, um, to comment on breaking down the doors, you're thinking you're looking at those options or those activities as a way to build engagement and interaction between you guys. Yeah. So there, you know, there are practical skills when you, when you have, um, and anybody, building confidence in, in their ability to, to handle firearms and protect themselves and their loved ones. Self-defense if you're ever confronted with something like that. But really in this community where, where Samantha works in, you know, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of trauma that's still underneath underneath the surface. And when you and when you start working self-defense and so when putting folks into these these stress situations, they're they're forced to deal with some things in a safe environment that they maybe hadn't dealt with before. Um, so, you know, ATP, we, we try to satisfy those immediate needs. If somebody is not safe, if somebody needs to be fed, if somebody needs surgery, we try to satisfy those immediate things so that they can move closer and closer to a faith walk. There you go. Awesome. That's, that's really awesome. <laughs> I don't, Paul, were you going to say something? I was just thinking about Jesus, you know, feeding the 5,000, he met their physical needs and then he met their spiritual needs. And and mm-hmm. if you can get the physical out of the way, I mean, I've, I've seen it in many ministries. Um, and, and that is to me, that is the heart of ministry. You know, people have come up to me and, and you guys, I guarantee it and said, why are you here and why do you care? And then you're like, well, because Jesus. So, you know, boom, I, I love mm-hmm. that. I'm getting goosebumps. It's uh, be the church <laughs> so you can be the church. Amen. Yeah. And, I, and I think that's a good example of the of the partnership with with Ruby's and Samantha. You know, I'm I'm more of the Jesus kicking over the tables of the money changer <laughs> or Peter cutting the ear off of the soldier, you know, and, and then and then Samantha and Ruby's are the ones that really can, can help with the healing and the, and the comfort to those that are suffering. Nice. All right. Awesome. Every well, now and then, though, I want to ch- change places with him. I want to <laughs> I want to kick tables, too. <laughs> I'm like, oh wait, let me stay in my lane. Hold on. <laughs> well, it sounds like if you if you attend the uh, the class that he's putting together, you'll be able to do that pretty yeah. <laughs> pretty soon. <laughs> That's awesome. So Samantha, tell us about your your ministry and your background. So my name is Samantha Summers Rivas. I'm the founder and president of Ruby's LV. We uh, we are a uh, faith based sex industry survivor led nonprofit ministry here in Las Vegas. Um, We help women and children that have been sexually exploited and or trafficked as well as their families. And so kind of like what Jeff had just mentioned right now, meeting their immediate needs, right? But not just the victims, sexual exploitation and sex trafficking. It's like throwing a pebble into a lake it sends a ripple Mm. effect and so it it not only affects the victim but it affects their family as well so we make sure that not only are we meeting the needs the immediate needs and then long-term needs of the victims but their families as well so that extends especially to um foster care families that have fictive kin foster care families that have taken in children whose bio parents are either being sexually exploited and or trafficked or the the parents are involved in trafficking um and so it's a huge demographic just to give you an idea in La- in las vegas nevada there's thirty eight thousand children that are in fictive kin foster care And so we are currently working on obtaining the data to finding out how many of those children have bio parents that have either been sexually exploited and or trafficked or bio parents that are the traffickers. Um, And those are just the children that are accounted for because there's thousands of children across the valley that wind up here from Ohio, Texas, Missouri, Mm -hmm other places, you know, I'm just naming where you guys are from. Um, But there's children that wind up here from all over the United States. So we make sure that we are meeting the needs of the victims as well as their family, 
short term and long term. Our partnership with All Things Possible has been a huge blessing because as you can imagine, this is not a very um, conventional or a cookie cutter, Christian cookie cutter <laughs> ministry. Um, yeah. You know, and I, I tried really hard in the beginning when I first started doing this type of ministry work. I tried really hard um, to fit in, you know, what is presented as a, as a cookie cutter ministry. But I, this demographic, the demographic that we're serving is, it's not, it's not an easy demographic. And I would know firsthand because I was sexually exploited myself. That's why we let everybody know that this ministry is sex industry survivor led. Why we say that and why it's important to mention that is because people that have come from working in the sex industry, whether they were trafficked or sexually exploited or in porn or uh, in a strip club or in a brothel, the, the mental health takes its toll eventually um, on most of them. And a lot of them are not with us anymore because they have committed suicide. And so the partnership that we have with All Things Possible is a great fit because they understand the complexities and the nuances of this type of ministry. They understand that it's very out of the box. Um, and the mental health that goes along with this demographic, this demographic of people that we serve, it's very similar to veterans. And so Victor is a veteran, Jeff is a veteran. Um, and so it really works well uh, and very cohesively. There's very little like, oh, let me explain this to you real quick. You know, you just kind of run an idea or, or you know, something that <laughs> happened by them. And they're like, oh, okay. As to where, you know, if you're at church, you're like, they're like, oh my gosh, oh no. You know, they're like clutching their pearls. It's like, you know, I can't, I can't sugarcoat this. Like, it's good for us to really know mm -hmm. and hear the facts of what I'm hearing and seeing uh, and letting them know like, hey, this is what I'm hearing and seeing. And then they're like, oh, okay. And they don't even bat an eyelash, you know? So it's it's very, it's good because I don't have to, you know, make it all pretty and put a little bow on it for them. They're like, oh, okay, they totally get it. So it's been a huge blessing <laughs> having uh, all things possible uh, partner with us. That's awesome. You, you know, one of the things that just kind of came to my mind for, for both you and Jeff and in your involvement in this ministry, one of the things you just said that stuck out is it's not conventional. And, you know, Jesus wasn't conventional. Jesus went to where people needed him, where he knew people needed him. And he hung out with people that uh, the conventional status quo thought, you know, was, was a waste of time. And, uh, <clears throat> sorry, I don't normally, <laughs> don't normally get choked up, but I, I honestly am. And to me, it's just amazing that, uh, that you guys have taken the steps to, uh, to, to do that and to go out and to say, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to go on the highways. I'm not going to go on the main, main roads. I'm going to go to where, people need Jesus and they yeah. need us to help them. And, you know, just to add on <laughs> to what I was just saying too, I don't mean to cut you off, but no, I, I want people to know that um, not only has the partnership with all things possible been very cohesive and we have covered, we have covered really good ground together just being a sex industry survivor and having a ministry like this, that's strong boots on the ground, Holy spirit filled to have a ministry like that partner with a sex industry survivor is a huge deal. Mm -hmm. And so if, if anybody wants, you know, point number one takeaway, this would be my point. If you're a church leader or pastor, pray about partnering with a survivor led ministry in your city, because not only does it give us strength in numbers spiritually and in so many other ways, but it's a huge encouragement for the, the survivor led ministry. I mean, for there, I, I cannot tell you what it does for me 
And it's not that I put my hope in ATP or, or in Victor or Eileen or in Jeff. It's that it, it's a, a huge source of encouragement because a lot of times survivor led ministries are kind of like, Oh, we don't know if we want to get involved with them, you know? And so to have a very strong, um, spirit led ministry partner with us is a huge encouragement for us. I'd love to throw a quick comment on there. Um, I got to do security for a, a team that was in Kansas City, Missouri, and uh, we had a gal with us. The heart, she was a survivor, had come out of prostitution, and we were driving down the street in a van. And imagine how this could have been received by this gal that was was hooking. She was sitting on a on a like a curb, a raised curb, and. Uh, hear this gal like scream stop the the driver thought we were going to hit somebody slams on the brakes she's out of the van running up to this gal and she's like honey i was you i want to help you and uh i was pulling security two irish looking white cops pull up and they're like hey buddy come here why are like 15 white people talking to a a <laughs> black hooker and they're all they're all women over there with her and they're loving on her and they're praying with her and they're doing this thing and it was it was this incredible ministry that I had never at the time seen anything like. This gal gave her life to the Lord on the corner and uh, her pimp actually rolled around and was eyeballing us and realized that, that they had security and they they left. And they whisked her out 24 hours later of Kansas City into a, a facility several hours away that they had set up. The whole thing was very secret. It was very clandestine. It was very compartmentalized and they they rehab gals, some of whom choose to go back into this ministry, some of whom relocate and start their lives over. And that was my first encounter uh, of many, but in my only one with that particular group. But the heart that this lady had because she had shared the experience, and that's where I'm going with that is, I've never walked that road. I have family that has, but I've never walked that road. And it's one thing to be a protector, but you can't fully understand unless you've lived it. And so the, the same way that my friends that go in and pull people out of drugs or about out of other addictions and environments, they can go, dude, I was you. I was you. Let me tell you. Let me tell you about my experience and how God saved me. And so anybody who is thinking about what Samantha just said, if you can find an organization that has the heart that is God fearing and God led and is going to go in and do this, they're equipped in ways that we can't be. That's my point. I think it's I think it's awesome too. Just circling back around to the veteran um, survivor connection between between you guys because um, I'm I'm not a veteran. Um, I come from a, a, a decent sized military family. Um, I I currently work for the Defense Department, um, but I work with veterans regularly, and I see a lot of the mental health that you're that uh, that you're mentioning and I, I never would have put that together um, on my own like think okay here's a connection here of two ministries that can really support each other but you guys you just made the case for it <laughs> and it sounds like it works out great for you which is awesome too to be able to to step forward and do that well, James let, let me tell you how how I had this epiphany um, there's a there's a young girl out there she's still out there her name is China She's out in California, and and we were we were we were working together. We had some involvement with with trying to help her change her life, and I actually went out to, to meet her. And I, and with, with what I do, I don't I don't meet a lot of the victims or, or the survivors. Like that's we that's those are jobs for folks like Samantha that just just understand them more. Um, but occasionally I will to try to to try to understand things directly. So here's this young African American girl. I think she was 18 or 19 at the time, and I, I, we we met at a park and we sat down and we were talking. And the thing that I couldn't get my arms around was this: how how do you even survive this? You know, how 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 does a young girl survive being raped by different men 10, 12 times a day? You know, she she's picked up, she's told what to wear, she's told where to be, she's told what her name is that day. And strange men just come in and out of a room, and and she's supposed to perform, and they and they rape her multiple times. And how how do you survive that year in and year out? And and I just couldn't get my arms around it. But as she was explaining how she compartmentalized things, and she focused on the positive, and even this this concept of I choose this. You'll you'll hear this all the time. And the way I understand 
the psychology is there it's the 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 industry itself and the exploitation and when I'm talking specifically of, of trafficking it's it's so brutal that you're you can't get your arms around it you begin to just pick these pieces out that you rationalize by saying well I, I choose this and and I didn't quite understand that and I, and I was sitting there across from this young girl and I, I and she just I realized we were the same I realized the way she copes with what she's going through is the same way that I cope and have coped with years mm -hmm. in combat. I just compartmentalize it. Mm -hmm. I choose to be a soldier. I don't choose to see my my friends get blown up around me. I don't choose to 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 to, to try to pack wounds and repair limbs and and children getting. You know, I, I don't choose that. Yet I choose I I choose parts of of my profession. And you'd stuff all that stuff in a metal box in the back of your mind, in the back of your brain, and then that thing begins to leak a little bit, and you've got to figure out ways to deal with that. So, you know, mm -hmm. I, I will never forget this young lady, China, sitting across from her and realizing, yeah, she's just like me. Except the difference is I have been trained. The U.S. military, special forces, had trained me how to deal with some of this adversity. Maybe not all of the psychological trauma, but they, they taught me how to deal with the the hardship you know the physical hardship you know the, the 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 difficulties that come with getting your arms around you know combat and the and the and the, the, the horrors that come with it um so that was the first time i realized it and then uh, you know since then as i've met more and more people like when we met samantha like like she explained we're simply kindred spirits because while my battlefield has been iraq and afghanistan and, and other places around the globe her battlefield has been the streets of Las Vegas, and there's just incredible similarities in that level of evil and exploitation. Wow. The amount of complex PTSD, regular PTSD, and the other mental health issues that both veterans and uh, sexually exploited and sexually trafficked victims share are like, they're very common. They're very, it, so that's why for myself, I was like, oh my gosh, this does make so much sense because yeah. there's night terrors involved, there's triggers involved, there's so many different things that normally I have, you know, I'm I'm at a I'm at a place in, in my healing because God has healed so many areas of my mind and my heart, but there's still some areas that I, I might not receive healing on this side, right? My body will be made whole and my mind will be made whole when I go to be with the Lord. But right mm -hmm. now, things that I normally have to try to keep in check, I know that if I'm hanging out with Jeff or or you know any of the other ATP members or Victor or Eileen, like if if I have like a trigger or something, normally I would try to hide that w around them. I don't have to try and hide it, you know, and just keep smiling. Samantha, are you okay? Oh yeah, I'm great. Yeah, I'm fine. I don't have to do that, you know? And so the, the healing process is continual and it's iron sharpening iron really, mm -hmm. you know, which is great. So yeah, it's been awesome to come to that realization of there's so many things that we have in common. I think that's an aha moment right there. I mean, certainly something I'm learning and taking away right off the bat is both of you sharing that component. Um, so certainly something none of the three of us have direct experience to have that degree of trauma or have that uh, common point that, that you talk about there. So it's it's really interesting to, to pick that out tonight. I think one of the others is, is this whole topic is something that has, has become closer to me um, as I moved across the country and ended up here in Texas. And part of that was reading a stat that placed Texas as the second most uh, number of trafficked children in the country. And it just shocked me. And as a dad of two, two young kids, it just, it, it hit me all the harder. And I think looking at it from that perspective, you, you, you try to sit there and start wondering why, but then I try to wear my hat as a church safety guy and say, okay, how does this not just, how does this impact me as a dad? How does this impact me as a Texan now? And how does this impact my church? And, I, and, and we talked a little bit about how do we be the church, but how does this impact those that are in the church? And perhaps it's, it's going down the path of myths about trafficking and other sorts of things. And I heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, 
I caught this anecdotally, but uh, that the myth is that it com it's coming from kidnappings and that they're kidnapping and then trafficking them. But when in fact they've heard it's coming in many times other cases as well. So if you have anything you can share on where is it starting, where is it coming from, and is it coming out of churches at all, or is the church really that refuge? If I could take that first, Jeff, if that's okay with you. Um, I like the fact that you bring up myths because there are, there's so many blanket statements that are put out there regarding sexual exploitation and sex trafficking. And the fact of the matter is there's different facets of it. Yes, there are kidnappings that are happening. There are people that are being, children that are being brought through, you said you're in Texas, through the, the Mexican border right there. And they're coming through saying, oh, this is these are my kids. Mm, no, they're not your kids. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that we've pushed for, um, making sure that our borders are tightened so that children are not being brought in under false pretenses and then sold in this country. Um, that might be something difficult for some of your viewers and listeners to hear me say, but as a Latina, my mom is Guatemalan. Um, I'm very aware of what's going on in, in Guatemala, El Salvador, Mexico. I mean, I can go on and on and on. Um, and so something that is, it, it, it is a fact that is happening. It's children that are being brought in under a false pretense that, oh, we're bringing our kids over. No, not that's not always the case. But I can't make a blanket statement and say, oh, that's the only way child trafficking is happening. There's other facets. There's grooming from uncles, grandfathers, uh, family friends that happen, that that also takes place. That happens as well. Um, there's our our vulnerable vulnerable children population of foster care kids that fall through the cracks i mean i can sit here and give you so many variables so to to make a blanket statement and say boom here's the blueprint of it right it, it i really nobody can do that we can tell you some facets of it and some things to look mm -hmm. for but at the end of the day what's called the game is constantly evolving. It's constantly changing. It's constantly morphing to whatever challenges or hurdles are being put in their way. Um, it's going to always change because there's a demand, a very high demand at that. And there's always money to be made for those traffickers. So they're going to always try and figure out a way. Um, what I would strongly encourage the church to do is to bring in a team like all things possible um and and say hey we're going to we're going to take our staff we're going to do a full day of training and and that's being like super like cutting it down i mean really it should be like a two like a two three day tr type training but bring in all things possible and say hey we're going to do a staff training it is mandatory for all pastors staff members and ministry leaders to sit on this sexual exploitation and sex trafficking training so that we can learn different things for us to to identify how we can approach it, and then how we could be part of the resolution of it. Mm -hmm. um, there's different ways that church members can get involved. Um, I know for us here in Nevada, our, uh, we're going into sessions in uh, February in front of legislature. So I've been watching different bills that are coming down the pipeline. That's another way to get involved. Mm -hmm. If you have church members that are at your church that are attorneys that can draft bills, um, that work with legislature to get certain bills passed. I mean, there's so many different ways that we can get in on the fight. Um, but at this point, it's, you know, this is Human Trafficking Awareness Month. Tomorrow's Human Trafficking Awareness Day. Everybody's being encouraged to wear blue. And that's great. To wear blue is great. But somebody wearing blue tomorrow doesn't help that little girl that fell out of the foster care system and has gone through the cracks and is being sold in a dingy, disgusting motel room being sold multiple times a day. And so forgive my frustration and my passion for that, but 
I just want people to understand like awareness is great, but don't let it stop there. Don't let it stop there. You have to be the hands and feet. You have to say, okay, well, I don't know. What can we do to get educated? Bring in all things possible. Let's do a training for our staff. Let's open a training to our congregation members. Let's start, you know, in integrating some of these practices so that we can identify victims or their families and then see how we can better serve them. Yeah, I have, it's, it's moving stuff. I, <laughs> I feel like jumping in and saying, let's take a break. I don't really want to take a break. I want both of you guys to keep going, but we will, uh, we will take a quick uh, sponsor break and then we will be right back. So hang out with us. And uh, if you'd like, uh, we will try and get to him. We have a lot of, a lot of information to go through, but if you have a question you'd like to post in the questions comment, uh, we'll take a look at it and we'll, we'll try and get to that tonight. So hang with us. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with you. With over 50 years of experience with religious and nonprofit organizations, Thomas Alexander Insurance and Associates understands that your congregation is different from a traditional business. We're here to fulfill your needs, coming to you while creating a personal plan for your budget and size. From your local community to around the globe, we are advocates for you. Thomas Alexander Insurance and Associates, your partner in service. church, bad things can happen. Medical emergencies, active shooters, predators, even domestic disputes. Is your church, is your ministry, is your sanctuary prepared? Do you have a safety or security team? Find out how you can be with James McGarvey's new book, The Case for Church Safety and Security. James McGarvey's experience and training, along with a biblical foundation, bring much needed information in today's trying times. It offers a true biblical perspective for starting, keeping, and growing a safety or security ministry in your church or place of worship. The Case for Church Safety and Security, a brand new book, includes a special foreword by Frank Pomeroy, the pastor at the First Baptist Church, Sutherland Springs, Texas, where they experienced the worst active shooter in U.S. history. This compelling book shares insight on preparing yourself and your church from potential threats with a biblical worldview. Start your journey to a more secure ministry and worship freely knowing you're safe. Get more information now at churchsafetyguys.com and pick up your copy today. Church Safety Guys is a nonprofit organization dedicated to help inspire, influence, and impact church safety and security teams. We are about all things church safety and security, which starts with a ministry mindset and a servant's heart. We're protectors, guardians, ambassadors, and shepherds. We help church and place of worship safety and security teams all over the United States through our broadcasts, online communities, conferences, trainings, resources, and products. Help us reach more churches in impactful ways by considering becoming a monthly ministry partner. $2, $5, $20 a month will help us continue to provide these resources. All right. Good evening and welcome back to the Sunday night broadcast of the Church Safety Guys. Uh, we just needed to take a quick sponsor break. So we're back with uh, Jeff from All Things Possible Ministries and then uh, Samantha from Ruby's LV. And uh, we were just talking about um, 
human trafficking, sex trafficking in that industry. And I, I'm going to throw it over to Jeff because he wanted to talk a little bit about kidnapping and uh, talk about some of the myths and whatnot. So uh, go ahead, sir. Thank you, guys. I'm going to pick up where, where we left off with Mike and Samantha both with this with this myth of kidnapping. And what, what the <clears throat> listeners have to recognize is what what we're largely talking about is a, is a business. It's an, an it's an illicit business where they sell sex. OK. And if you have a young lady that you want to sell over and over and over, how do you sell over and over a kidnapped girl? It's 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 almost impossible. And I'm going to I'm going to speak very candidly. If a young girl is kidnapped, you're probably going to end up looking for a body. She's going to be murdered. She's not going to be brought into the sex industry because it's too risky. When a young girl is kidnapped, every police officer in that district is looking for that girl. How do you then advertise and put that girl up for sale? How do you move that girl across a border? How do you get her to another country? Again, like Samantha said, all of these things happen. You know, the taken idea of, you know, Russian mafia kidnap your, your daughter from upstairs. And next thing she knows, she's she's drugged on a plane and she wakes up in Romania. Yeah, th th those things happen. But again, do the cost benefit analysis on that. How much did that cost? How do they make up their money? What what happens is these young men pretend to be something they're not. They, they approach these girls as a boyfriend and they begin to lure them away from those things that make them safe. So. You're going to see girls coming in and out of the church that are being trafficked. But again, the church should be a safe place where that girl can be loved upon and she can, she can, her, her self esteem can be built and she can find some mercy and grace. So there are many times where that trafficker, he won't want her to, to be at church. Okay. So keep that in mind. It's not, it's mm -hmm. not kidnapping. So how about uh, an 18 year old girl who runs away from home? Where do you think that stacks on the deck with law enforcement? Okay, here's the simple answer. An 18 year old girl cannot run away from home. She's 18. She can leave home any second she wants. Now, if she's 17 or 16 and she ran away from home and the cops show up and they say, where did she go? And the parents say, I think she's living with her boyfriend. How, how much effort do you think law enforcement is putting into that one? Because how many times does that happen? And it's, and it's not nefarious. It's just a young lady and it's a young man and, and they're in love and they're and they're trying to get their life started. So the, the, this crime, it, it's not the fringes. It, it's the center. And you've got to think of these young ladies as the commodity. And if that if that girl is kidnapped, she is going to be consumed in a, in a short amount of time. They want to get a couple years out of out of this this product of theirs. You know, statistically, again, it may be a dubious statistic or not. They say the average lifespan of, of a young lady trapped in commercial sex is about seven years. Like Samantha said, they end up dying by their own hand, by the hand of their pimp, by the hand of their John, or some sort of accident overdose. So even though um, when I'm talking to them as a consumable, and that should piss people off. People should be angry that I'm talking about human beings as consumable products. That's what they're considered. They are consumable products by these traffickers and by these pimps. And then, of course, by the Johns. They're consuming them for their pleasure. So um, I just wanted to touch upon that. Um, it, it, is, it is much more simple. People need to stop looking for these giant conspiracy theories. It is, it is daily, 99 times out of 100, it is a young man wooing a girl into this space or somebody in the family driving this young lady in, into this space. Um, and sometimes that's even harder for us to get in between, right? Sure. So that I, I kind of want to expound on that a little bit because you mentioned something, Jeff, about it being more simple. And I think a, a lot of times in our minds, we think it's like you said, it's it's something cloak and dagger at night. You know, it's going to be this person is going to be rushed away. And I want to I want to look at it from the aspect of, you know, you mentioned a boyfriend or something like that. So I have I've seen um, actually good friends with an officer down in Florida and I. Uh, we actually looked at a case like he brought it to my attention where an individual was trying to traffic a young lady out of a church, uh, out of a service on Wednesday night. And I'm not sure the specifics, if he was her boyfriend or what exactly, you know, all of that happened to be. 
but what to to try and I guess make it a little bit more practical. What do you think some of the signs of of just awkward behavior or or maybe a red flag might be um, for someone that like I, I I'm the safety director at my church on Wednesday night I I interact with the leaders you know I know what they're doing I know what their plans are and that sort of thing. But for me, I don't know specifically what to even look for to say that's a red flag. That's not that's not right. We need to get more help in here. So I was just wondering if, if you guys could expand on that a little bit. <laughs> I'll take one quick and then hand it to Samantha. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you, it, James, if, if somebody came to us and said, I'm concerned that my daughter, my niece, this girl at our church may, may be involved in trafficking or, or at risk of, of trafficking, what we do at ATP is we start looking on social media about what her persona looks like. Okay, when she's at church, mm-hmm. chances are she's not going to be overly sexualized, right? If, you, if you're if you're a young lady at church who's overly sexualized, that's probably a good indicator that some, something is askew, right? So, again, this is really a common sense crime. It's about sex. It's about fantasy. It's it's about sex. So if a if a young lady is coming to church like overly sexually dressed. Mm-hmm. Somewhere along the line, her her mores have been skewed, right? Like she doesn't understand that this is an inappropriate dress for church. So that's that's a that's a very easy one. And again, you're not accusing her of some sort of misconduct, but there's it's probably a potential indicator that something isn't right with her view of sexuality, right? So but often you're not gonna see it at church, you're not gonna see it at school, but you're gonna see it on these other outlets. And while social media is absolutely devastating on on opening uh, gaps and vulnerabilities for traffickers to exploit. It's mm-hmm. also this because young people just share everything about themselves, right? They share their dreams and their desires and the things that that make them sad and their disappointments and their fears and and their locations constantly. So while while that is a nightmare for for the good guys, the flip side of that is they share all that stuff online also. So while it might not be, you know, um, James, uh, you know, James number one Facebook, set, you know, on Facebook, it might be, you know, Jimmy John, some some secret hidden social media account where you're you're sharing what's happening in your life, and that's oftentimes what we're looking for, is just those tiny little clues, those those usages of words that seem inappropriate. Um, but what I would also tell you at church. And, and it wasn't me, you know, we, we had, uh, you know, Johnny, Johnny's out there, you know, we all have that Johnny at our church and, the, and, and, and that, that couple that is just, they just know how to. So it, when I would see a young lady that looked to be in trouble or depressed or something, I would talk to Johnny and his wife and say, Hey, I think something might be wrong there. And they would go approach her. I was, I was actually back at my, my high school, um, over Veterans Day speaking, and I was talking in a class, and I saw a young lady, and like like Samantha, I I, I wasn't in the life, okay, but I've I've been around it enough that I I can see certain things that just I can't really explain to you. It's like that Malcolm Gladwell blink idea instinctively, and I asked my friend, I said, hey, what what's the story with that young lady? So oh, she's pretty quiet, you know. I think her parents are going through a divorce. I said some somebody needs to follow up with her. Something is not. Right. And if you if, if somebody intervenes early like that, you have a much higher chance of helping this young person than by the time they're weeks and months or years into the game where they're just so trapped they can't see a way out. Yeah, I agree. I'm going to I'm going to piggyback on that. Um, sure. Something that Jeff just brought up is identifying youth in our church that are going through something big, right? You know, uh, uh, your parents are, you're a young adult or a teenager and your parents are going through a divorce or one of your parents have just passed away. I know Mm. for myself, I was in a vulnerable position because my father passed away from lymphoma cancer when I was 16. And then my mom had to start working 10, 12 hour days to support us, right? Which is the right thing to do. Because a lot of times I think people look at 
the the girls or the young men that are working that what's called a track or a blade which is the the streets you know and they go oh those kids are just being you know blah 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 and it's like no they have been put in positions where it's like fight or flight like you need do i what is my option to eat today like what is my option to survive today for some it's what is my option to have a roof over my head tonight you know and so instead of just assuming that these kids are just you know out there running amok for whatever reason what got them to that point you know um or or some or some sometimes i've heard people say oh where are those kids parents well does somebody want to ask me where my parents were because i'd like to tell them you know what are you going to what fault did my parents have in it? My parents didn't have any fault, you know, and that was really, really hard to explain to my mom, you know, because I remember when I first told her and she was like, you know, I, I, I messed up as a parent and I'm like, you didn't though, you know, my dad died and you had to go to work and you had to take on jobs that you knew to do best. You know, and for her, it was housekeeping. We lived in California and, and, and that's, you know, it was great, you know, for her to do that there. And, you know, God provided that avenue and that outlet for her to be able to provide for me and her, you know, so we can't make those assumptions like, oh, well, where are those kids' parents at? You know, well, if you want to know where they're at, why don't you go and ask, especially if we're at church, you know, that's why it's important to get involved with our middle schoolers and our high schoolers at church. Another thing that people want to be, you know, re that they want to realize, and I think I heard it in your promo, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, we're at church, so we're safe. And it's like, I'm always, I've never said that. <laughs> and I think in our last podcast I, you, that I did with Jeff, I said, you know, the, it, the church should be an ER of jacked up people. You know, our guts are spewing over, like we're bleeding to death. It shouldn't be a, an, you know, a, a museum of saints. And so, you know, I don't walk in and go, oh yeah, I'm going to let my kids you know, run wild and free because nothing's going to happen here. I mean, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. I, maybe it's my trauma. Maybe I'm just negative Nancy. I'm all I'm saying is that when we're at church, I don't just assume like, oh, we're going to all be safe. I know pimps that go to church. I know pimps that send their children to private schools that are located at churches, you know, and it's not just men that are recruiting the girls. They send in women to recruit the girls too. So it's important to develop, not to develop deep relationships with people not these churchy superficial just surface you know relationships let's really get to know one another let's really get to be in a habit of being prayerful for one another you know and being able to be transparent with one another so many times it's like i know when i first started going to church i mean i didn't even think i would be allowed back at church and and much less share my story you want share my story are you kidding me like they're gonna kick me out as soon as they hear my story or i'm gonna become the topic of gossip you know and so it's like um just making sure that we're being warm, that we're being welcoming, that we're really executing what God is calling us to do as far as, far as genuinely loving on people and genuinely hearing what's going on in their lives, mentoring people. Um, you know, if you see, if you know of a, of a child that just lost their parent and now there's, it's a single mom situation, like how can you and your wife come alongside of this single mom and this child and help them and not just, girls are being trafficked boys are being trafficked as well i can't tell you how many times when we've gone to the homeless teen shelter here i've had boys young men tell me and they'll tell me they won't tell the other men that are there serving they'll hmm. they'll come to me which i'm so grateful for and they're they'll come find me and they'll tell me that they're they don't struggle with homosexuality but they do sell themselves because they sometimes it was a matter of what was I going to eat or I had a job opportunity and I didn't have clothes to go to go to the interview with. And so there's different things that we can be in prayer, pray and ask God for that discernment to see who you need, who he wants you to see, who you need to speak to and who is, you know, if there's a red flag with somebody for him to really show you what you can do to address it. 
I think you touched on so many things that I want to circle back around on that. And I appreciate that. We, I just, we don't have the time. So we, uh, if, if you guys are up for it, we may have to bring you back on at some point <laughs> for sure. But one of the things that, that I, I will say, um, just kind of wrapping, wrapping things up for this evening is, is you mentioned that, um, church shouldn't be a place for, for healthy people and that it should be treated as, as more of like an ER. And, you know, I think we're, I think honestly, we're going through a cultural shift, um, of individuals, older generations that maybe felt like church was supposed to be all pristine. And like you mentioned, and now we're realizing and, and we're, Unfortunately, and, and I know this is true in safety and security, but we're on the, the, the catch up and of trying to make things better and realize, wait a second, we should have had this. We should have done this. This is how we should have done. But in ministry across the board, we're seeing a generational gap in motivation and engagement and a closeness in exactly what you just said about individuals being real with each other and individuals reaching out and getting to know each other and not being superficial. And I think honestly, you know, hearing, hearing you mention that tonight just makes me think that the church, you know, it's not just church safety and security. Uh, it's, you know, every ministry in the church, we need to be looking at this. We need to be looking at how to engage with others. Um, and we need to be, uh, we need to be open to open to the wisdom, open to, to God's leading with with praying and asking for wisdom in those situations. And, you know, we emphasize praying like with your team before every service starts, you know, before you jump into the middle of a service, focus on, you know, what could go wrong and focus on wisdom from God. And I think, honestly, this just... To me, this is just one other thing that we need to be looking at and focused on and say, you know what? Okay, now I need to be looking at kids that, you know, maybe I need to minister to somebody or maybe I need to look at these signs or symptoms or try and be involved before um, before it gets to that point. So I'm going to turn it over real quick to, to Mike and Paul, see if you guys have any, any closing thoughts. Um, I don't. I mean, honestly, I really, really appreciate you guys both coming on and spending the time with us tonight because um, it's hard. It's it's a hard topic and it's hard to follow up. I love both of your, your passion and your enthusiasm for it. That's, to me, that's got to be a God thing um, that, you know, God's put you in that place to do what you do because, you know, you do it as well as you do. Yeah. But... Um, Thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate being here. Mike, did you want to add anything real quick? Yeah, I, th I think it, it amazing. And, and I think there's, there's, I can count on one hand, uh, the number of the episodes I think uh, that we've had that have really had this moving or hard hitting topic. That's something that I think we can all walk away from having learned something and we talk about gold nuggets all the time and little things that we take away and we get those a lot, but then we have uh, episodes like tonight where it's, it's such a moving story and, and a real piece where not only are we learning, but I think the big part is what we take away is that the opportunity to act. And I think that act is what I even heard too, is that doesn't look right. We say that a lot within this industry of church safety. Well, what if we applied that same concept of it doesn't look right and we looked for that opportunity to reach out to that person so that it's not just a safety and security thing, but it's a human thing. And we say, look, that doesn't look right. It's my job to step in, not because I wear a hat that says security, but because, you know what, I'm a fellow human being and we want to protect these people. Mike, you yeah. should be spot on. And it, it's it's this simple, and this is what I want to leave folks with that are always looking for something. When when you see a young person, it, it, even an even an older woman it doesn't have to be a young person. But when you somebody see somebody who seems to be hurting, at your church, at McDonald's, on the street, just take a second and say, "Are are you okay?" And and they'll probably shrug you off. Maybe someone on the street will will curse at you, 
but then stop again and say, no, really, are, are, are you okay? And it may be that moment when there's that person who's ready to share, you know, especially at church. You know, you can say a church security team or these greeters or whomever, everyone has their Johnny and Audrey's like we have at our church. Yeah. You know, are you okay? Are you, are you really okay? If, if you're not okay, if you don't feel safe, you, you can come to us and, and there's a safe place for you here. Just communicate that to a young person. Communicate that to a boy or a girl or, or, or a woman who's in trouble. It may not be that day, but at least it begins to chip away at these lies that they've been told. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. Are you okay? Mm -hmm. Real quick, before we leave, uh, yeah. another resource that I want to make sure I offer to everybody that listens to this. If you go to our website, rubieslv.com, we have uh, videos a little bit lengthy. They're a little bit in length uh, with my <laughs> testimony on there. I try sure. not to be long-winded, but I got a lot to say, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, folks. Um, there, my video testimony is on there, but we just launched our Ruby's LV podcast. And our first guest was um, Sarah Jane Vegas. She runs Stand for Justice, and she is a sex trafficking survivor. She was trafficked through Fran uh, France and Belgium. And so I encourage everybody, listen to survivor stories. If you want to really understand and have some key points to reference back to listens to, list definitely listens to listen to survivor um stories so that you can have that insight that's great well sir i'll turn it over to paul he can he can pray us out and then uh then we will call it an evening no pressure paul yeah it's gonna take the lord <laughs> to help me to follow everything that you're doing. Um, all right let's let's pray this out Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, you are good. We live in a world that is evil, um, and this is not our home, and I'm thankful that we're just passing through. But yes. Lord God, I think I am thankful for people like, like Samantha, like Jeff, like these ministries that are really out there, that, that, are, that really have the heart. They're not just a name. They're not just looking for money. And Lord God, I ask that you would bless them, you would guide them, you would protect them very supernaturally, that you would give them the opportunities, that you would give them a stamina and a drive that is beyond the physical, and that you would reward those efforts, Lord God, that you would go ahead of them via your Holy Spirit and make the appointments, Lord God. I've seen those things happen, and they defy logic because you made them happen. So Lord God, I thank you as the church that we got the opportunity to hear these things tonight. Uh, we are humbled by them. And I ask that you would help the churches that this resonates with to realize this isn't glamorous. This isn't Hollywood. You're not kicking in doors. Uh, you're praying with somebody. You're, you're helping them get the, the counseling, everything they need, Lord God. And probably we're going to help them in a way that's not hands on through another ministry. I thank you for these folks and what they do. And we give you the honor and the glory tonight in your son, Jesus name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, thanks for joining us tonight, guys. And uh, next week, we're actually going to have uh, Dwayne uh, Harris with Full Armor Church. He'll be joining us and he uh, we will actually be talking about uh, anger and a little bit of de-escalation and uh, and helping your team, your your safety team associate and uh and deal with that sort of thing so as always feel free to visit us on churchsafetyguys.com and uh, reach out to us if we can be of, of any help uh, or resource to you in your your church and until next time uh, god bless and and take care have a great night guys thank you for joining the church safety guys broadcast we hope that you found it informative and we appreciate your feedback Looking for ways you can help us reach more churches? Share our broadcast with your teams. Consider becoming a monthly ministry partner. Like and share our page and join the discussion in our Facebook groups. Visit our website at churchsafetyguys.com for other great resources. Remember to keep a servant's heart, a mindset of ministry, and semper disciplina. Always be training. Have a blessed week.